The year is 1978 and Harley-Davidson is at a crossroads. Deep into the dark ages of the AMF days, Harley-Davidson is struggling with quality control issues and the ever-increasing competition from Japanese manufacturers. Harley-Davidson needed an answer to these cheaper and more reliable Japanese competitors that were quickly gobbling up market share in the American motorcycle markets. Two groups of engineers would both be assigned the task to develop Harley-Davidson's next generation engine and motorcycle platform to replace the aging shovel head design that had run its course. One of the two teams, in collaboration with Porsche, would make a higher revving liquid cooled engine, which would be a major departure from Harley-Davidson's core engine architecture of a V-twin air-cooled engine. This bike in development would be known as Project Nova, and the engineers were working on three different variations, a V-twin, a V4, and a V6. It would also come in a sport and a touring configuration. The overall look of this bike was unique and different from what Harley-Davidson designers had done in the past and what core Harley-Davidson customers were used to. The other team of engineers were working on a project that would eventually be known as the Evolution Engine. The 80 cubic inch air-cooled Evo was a lot more in line with Harley-Davidson's traditional engine architecture that would eventually go on to be Harley-Davidson's bread and butter for the next 20 years. In 1981, a major shakeup was happening within the motor company. American Machine and Foundry, better known as AMF, had bought Harley-Davidson back in 1969 and at this point had all but run it into the ground. A group of passionate investors and upper management at Harley-Davidson Motor Company decided to step up and buy the company back. The buyout would be led by some of the most iconic figures in Harley-Davidson's history, namely Willie G. Davidson and Vaughn Bills, who at that point would become the CEO. New life and energy had been infused into the motor company, and at that point, the eagle soared alone. It was at this point that Harley-Davidson's upper management needed to make a pivotal decision that would ultimately chart the course for the future decades to come. Do they make a radical shift in engine design and style by launching the Project Nova? Or do they play it safe and launch the Evolution air-cooled engine and give the customers the look, sound, and feel that they've all grown accustomed to from Harley-Davidson? I think at this point that most of us know that Harley-Davidson went with the Evolution engine, which has been accredited for bringing Harley-Davidson back into prosperity. And the Evo motor and the FXR frame has been completely immortalized in the Harley-Davidson world and many still believe today that it's the best bike that Harley-Davidson has ever made. But would the Project Nova be put on the shelf and forgotten about forever? In 1984, the engineers would take the fairing and saddlebags that were originally designed for the Project Nova and apply them to an FXR to make the FXRT. This bike would be categorized as a sport touring motorcycle called the Sport Glide. And to be honest, the reception of this motorcycle would be very lackluster. A lot of the core Harley-Davidson enthusiasts would reject this style, and sales would be somewhat mediocre. It wouldn't be until over 30 years later that a new up-and-coming generation of riders would gravitate towards this old retro style. The FXR would re-emerge onto the Harley-Davidson scene and begin to resonate with some of the younger riders, a younger rider demographic that Harley-Davidson had been criticized for not doing the right thing to appeal to, a generation of rider that favored the V-twin look, sound, and feel of an air-cooled pushrod motor and the retro styling and appeal of the FXRT. Also influenced and adopted by the club Dyna scene, the FXRT style was gaining momentum and popularity, especially in Southern California and up the West Coast. Aftermarket companies were scrambling to reproduce this fairing style that could be bolted up to Dynas and modern softtails. The reproduction in the aftermarket world of the FXRT fairings were becoming very prevalent. These fairings and bags had an appeal on multiple levels. They both delivered an awesome retro style that was true to Harley-Davidson's roots and heritage, and they also provided a level of functionality that isn't typically found in a middleweight cruiser. Little did the original Project Nova engineers know that it wouldn't be until over 35 years later that their design would be fully appreciated. And not only would it be fully appreciated, it would probably be the inspiration behind one of the most popular bikes to ever roll off Harley-Davidson's assembly line.
Hey guys, Matt Laidlaw here, coming to you from Laidlaw's Harley-Davidson. Today I had the opportunity to take out the brand new Harley-Davidson Lowrider ST. So this is a bike that I think a lot of people have been hoping for Harley-Davidson to develop for a while now. We've seen a lot of the aftermarket companies take Dynas, you know, Street Bobs, Lowriders, and then when the, in the 2018 model year, when Harley-Davidson came out with the new Softail frame, the Lowrider S was kind of the, the Dyna Bro bike of choice and a lot of these guys in the aftermarket world were adding these throwback retro style FXRT fairings, adding bags and now Harley Davidson is basically taking what has been real popular in the custom world and package it in, in the way that Harley Davidson does it and made it a factory bike with the fit and finish and everything that Harley Davidson is known for and they did a great job. So let me take you through this thing real quick. So first off, the base of the bike is pretty much the same as the Lowrider S. For those of you who are familiar with the Lowrider S, again, Harley-Davidson relaunched the Lowrider S in the 20 model year, and the bike's been a huge success. And now we have the benefit of the fairing on here. So when Harley-Davidson developed this, they really were trying to take some of the old FXRT fairing DNA and style and modernize it and obviously put it through a lot of the digital wind tunnel testing and things like that to make it more of a modern function and, and just a better overall fairing than they were back in the, the 80s and 90s. You have things like the five gallon gas tank. Harley Davidson this year in all their ST models, they've introduced the 117 cubic inch Milwaukee 8, which is pretty big and significant. Before this, we only saw that ship from the factory on the CVO models, so Harley Davidson has now giving us the 117 on a non-CVO. And this engine is very suiting for this as well because this is a bike that you want to get out on the highway and really do some traveling on. A lot of what I've said in the past is, you know what, if you want to go do, do touring, you want luggage space and you want fairings, always go with the touring chassis bike. The one bike that was kind of a crossover before this was the Heritage. And I think with the Heritage, you really had to be in love with the style that it delivered. This here is what I would consider a more of a modern version of a crossover bike that is on the soft tail chassis that could cross over into the, the touring capable realm. One of the main things that I was really hoping uh, to really test out on the highway today was the fairing and the wind deflection properties that it has. And, and I gotta say, it did a great job. Many of you know that I'm abnormally tall. I'm six foot six. And so if I were to buy this bike myself, I would definitely go with a taller windshield. But you know, I did a lot of the slouching and, and bending down to you know get my head where I think most people's head would be around that 510, 511 range. And it's better than anything that has, we've ever seen on the soft tail platform before or the Dyna platform as far as wind deflection and touring comfort out on the highway. So we went up PCH a little bit and we were doing 65 mile an hour plus out on the freeway. The fairing was very nice, but I will say too that they also put the taller shock in both the Lowrider S and the Lowrider ST this year as well. So you have an additional inch of travel in the tail end here. That makes a big difference. Some of you may say well it's just an inch but really an inch made a big difference so out on the highway the predecessor to this bike and just the regular lowrider s you, you felt it you know a lot of, a lot of people were upgrading their suspension right away this is a shock and, and a setup that i think a lot of people could buy and ride it and enjoy it for a long time right out of the box and not feel like they need to spend that 900 dollars extra to be changing the monoshock in the frame we took it up through the twisties one of the things that as we talked to the engineers they said was they did retune the front end so you do not have the same internals that, you, that we've seen on the Lowrider S in the past. A lot of that was retuned uh, to accept the additional weight of the fairing on here. And the bike handled great through the twisties. A lot of you that have ridden the Lowrider S before, you're going to get a similar feel. You're really not compromising any of the flickability or the nimbleness of the bike with the added weight on here. Yes, you do have a little bit of extra weight on here, but honestly, it's still going to perform pretty much to the core of, of what we've been used to with this new soft tail platform, which many of you know in the 2018 model year when they changed to the Monoshock soft tail platform, it's light years better than the Dynas and, and certainly the soft tails as well. As far as the, the tank and instrumentation go, so they went with a short T-bar style on here and you have an LCD screen that's very similar to what we saw in the Street Bobs when they relaunched in the 2018 model year. So very minimalist digital footprints on this bike. I see guys probably going to the analog gauges and things like that for the looks and, and just kind of the style and the vibe that a lot of guys that are buying these bikes are, are gonna do. But again, right out of the box, you have all the information you need, you know, your speedo, you can toggle through the different menus to get like your trip meter and your RPM and things like that. I think RPM was the setting that I had it on for the majority of the day actually, just to see where I was at. Speaking of RPM, I feel like on the 117, it likes to run about 500 RPM a little bit higher than in 
the Milwaukee 8, like the 114 cubic inch Milwaukee 8 and the 107 Milwaukee 8. I was cruising a lot in fourth gear actually, fourth gear at about 3,500 RPM. I was doing about 68 miles an hour. This is an engine, I'm assuming probably due to the cam profile, it likes to be revved out a little bit more than I'm used to. Typically on the 114 Milwaukee 8 and the 107, around 3,000 RPM is like a nice cruising speed where you have immediate access to, to power and good throttle response at 3,000 RPM. On this bike, I, I would say that's about 3,500 RPM. So 3,500 RPM plus is where you're gonna have like the meat of the power and it really starts to pull hard once you get to about 42, 4,300 RPM. That being said, we had some really technical windy roads that we were going through today. Uh, up north of Santa Barbara, beautiful area by the way, if you ever guys ever get the opportunity to ride north of Santa Barbara, awesome roads up there. But we got in some tight technical areas and, and just in and out of first gear and everything, you had that low end torque that you needed to exit corners so you're not making any compromises there with the 117. You know, I just got off of the new Sports of the Nightster yesterday and it's interesting because I felt like my rider triangle was more open on that small Sportster than it was on this. I felt the combination of the seat and the foot pegs had me cramped. Again, I'm six foot six and so I think most people won't experience that, but I think if you're above six feet, you're gonna to wanna to get a seat that allows you to, to scoot back a little bit more. This seat is very similar and it reminds me to like the Road Glide ST as well. I feel like Harley Davidson bumped these up a little bit too much. I, I would like to see it back an inch. Again, it just all kind of depends on your height. The other thing is I feel like the, the lean angle is great on these, really good actually, but I feel like the pegs are higher than maybe most people, well, tall people would like. And, and therefore your knees are up a little bit higher in relationship to the tank than, than I personally would like. But a couple modifications, moving the seat back for me, I'd probably solve that problem right away. If I were to customize this bike myself, I'd probably go to a taller riser as well. Bars are nice, it's great stock setup. You definitely have the look that a lot of people are going for. Bags are awesome, we've seen these bags before. We saw them on the Sport Glide when the Sport Glide launched mid model year in the 2018 model year. We personally have used these bags on a lot of the custom bike builds that we've done at our shop. Namely, a, a lot of bikes where we've used like an aftermarket FXRT fairing, once again, Super excited now that we don't have to buy the aftermarket FXRT fairings anymore. You can get them right from the factory with Harley Davidson's fit and finish and their engineering and the geometry that everything goes with a bike coming from the factory. But the bags are detachable just like we saw on the Sport Glide. Very simple, you open the bag, it's one knob and the bag comes off. So if you're not doing a long trip, you don't need the storage space. Those come off very easily and very seamlessly. You got LED lights pretty much all the way around. The turn signals are halogen, but the tail light and the headlight are all LED. So really good visibility. Much like the Lowrider S, you do have the dual disc brakes in the front. Great stopping power. The stopping power on these soft tails is awesome. Even the single disc brake is really good, but Harley Davidson went all in on, on these Lowrider S and Lowrider STs and really made them very performance oriented. So I want to lay down a little bit more practical information for you guys as well and answer some of the most frequently asked questions that I've already seen come up on this bike. First of all, the fairing on this bike is not detachable, so you do have to be in love with the style and the look of this bike with the fairing on here. I also get asked a lot if this fairing will bolt up to a Lowrider S, either current model year or past model years, and the answer is no officially. If you had enough ingenuity and money to do it, could you do it? Absolutely, but it's really not a plug and play, just bolt it up and have the bike perform form in the correct manner like a lot of people would hope that it would be. So Harley Davidson's official response on whether or not you can order all the parts to assemble this fairing and bolt it on a Lowrider S is a negative at this point. There is a pretty awesome audio bar that can be purchased for this bike out of the parts and accessory catalog. It's a thousand dollars and the fairing was designed in concert with this audio bar. The audio bar is operated by an app that is downloaded to your phone. It's a Harley Davidson specific app and through that you gain access to the radio controls. There are no controls on the hand controls.
controls, including volume and, and track skip and things like that. So you don't have the functionality that some of us are used to that come on like the touring chassis bikes, like the road glide and street glide fairing stuff. It does come with the feature of the automatic volume control based on your speed. This bike does too come with the 43 millimeter inverted front end, much like the Lowrider S. Like I mentioned earlier, the front end is tuned a little bit different based on the additional weight of the fairing on this bike. One of the slight hindrances that I noticed a little bit and other riders sometimes notice with the snorkel style heavy breathers that are also found on the road glide and the street glide ST is sometimes they can get in the way of your shin or your leg. I never once felt like my knee was pressed up against it or I accidentally bumped it or I felt the vibration transfer from that heavy breather into my shin area. So I think the two models that this bike is going to get shopped against are basically the Lowrider S and like a Road Glide or a Street Glide. This is kind of that in-between bike where you kind of get the best of both worlds. And, and honestly, guys, I think this is probably one of the most versatile bikes that I've ever seen come from Harley Davidson. And we've seen bikes like this come out, you know, like the Sport Glide. And like in 2010, a bike called the Switchback was launched that had, you know, detachable fairing and detachable bags. But honestly, none of the fairings were anywhere even close to like a touring chassis bike like the shark nose and batwing fairings that we see on the touring chassis bikes so i never really felt like they were a true crossover i always felt like they were more you know closely related to the dyna or the soft tail families this however i feel like is a bike that is in the center of the spectrum when we compare those bikes so i wanted to give you guys a little bit of buyer's advice and that's really what i always try to do on this channel is steer people in the direction of the bike that is going to suit their riding needs the most and honestly it always comes down to the type of riding you're going to be doing and where you prioritize certain things so I think the people that are probably going to be shopping for this bike are people that prioritize the middle weight soft tails that Harley Davidson has in their lineup right now. Bikes that are around that 700 pound range as opposed to the 800 plus pound range of the touring chassis bikes. And it's probably someone that gets out on the highway a lot and does overnighter trips once in a while that also could really benefit from the wind deflection of a fairing up here. So what I would do is I would ask myself, okay, do I really prioritize the more favorable power to weight ratio and the smaller frame? that this bike has. I would also be honest with myself about my stature. If you're someone who's above six foot and does a lot of freeway touring riding, I almost wouldn't even consider this bike. I would almost definitely go with a touring chassis bike. Unless you're someone that just really likes this style and really likes the, the power to weight ratio and you're willing to spend a few bucks to make the bike work, like some of the things that I mentioned to make it work for a taller rider. But if you're someone who's about 5'5", five, five, all the way up to about 5'11", six foot, I feel like this bike is probably gonna fit you pretty well right out of the box. Here's some more stuff to consider as well. Well, on the touring bike, I just feel like it is still a better long haul freeway bike that is more suited for long trips and overnight stuff for a couple reasons. One, you have more storage in the saddlebags. The saddlebags on the Lowrider ST probably only give you about three quarters of the space that the touring chassis bags give you. And although this fairing is very good and probably the best fairing that I've felt on a Dyna or a Softail before from the factory, it still, in my opinion, is not as good as the Street Glide or the Road Glide fairing. As far as wind deflection and really just keeping the wind off of your body and your head, I'd say it's probably about 60 to 75% as capable as the road glide or the street glide fairing. The other thing that you should really consider is the lack of electronics on this bike. You do have cruise control, which is very, very nice. It's almost mandatory in my book for long road trips, but you don't have any type of infotainment system whatsoever. Now you could get a handlebar mount and mount your phone up on your handlebars and get ear pods and, and have the music and everything and use navigation off of your phone. But honestly, I personally like it right Right there in my fairing where I can use the joysticks on my handlebars and look for things like gas stations or hotels or restaurants while I'm out on the road. Doing stuff like that on the fly with a cell phone mounted on your handlebars for me is almost impossible unless I'm stopped somewhere. So having all the GPS navigation capability plus the audio and media capability of the fairing and then also the communications with the Bluetooth with the phone and when the phone call comes in the music dies down and things like that. I personally really favor having all those electronics in my fairing for the type of riding I do, but maybe you're someone who doesn't prioritize the electronics and the infotainment system and everything that offers for you. You don't want that huge digital footprint that it takes up in your fairing. You don't want the additional weight and you don't want the additional electronics complexity on the bike. And then if you don't care about that stuff, that's one more foot in the direction of the Lowrider ST. Now, if your circumstances are you're a guy that isn't really comfortable with a really large, heavy touring chassis bike, let's say you're someone who's smaller in stature and you just feel more comfortable with the lighter soft tail chassis, then I would say definitely go with the Lowrider ST. 
you're gonna have a bike that probably fits you a lot better than a touring chassis bike. You're gonna have a bike that's really comfortable out on the road, and you're gonna have a bike that can cross over into real aggressive canyon riding all in the same package. One thing that I think may surprise a lot of people is I personally felt like the suspension on the Lowrider ST was better tuned for highway comfort going down the road, especially like on the Road Glide and the Street Glide Special, that touring shock when you get out on the road and you start hitting some really rough stuff, that rear shock can beat you up a little bit. That being said, if you go to like a larger like 13 inch shock and the touring chassis at that point overall for the highway i do prefer the touring chassis bikes one you feel just a lot more planted and stable at high speeds that's not to say that these soft tail chassis aren't planted and nice at high speeds because they definitely are but if you get out on the open road and you start getting a lot of turbulent wind you start passing the big rigs and you get these pocket and gusts of wind and everything i just feel a lot more planted and secure out on the road on a touring chassis bike the other thing to consider too is passenger comfort if you're riding with two people for long distance i definitely favor the touring chassis bikes just because you do have more options for seating the other thing you should consider too is additional storage space on the touring chassis bikes that don't already come with the tour pack like your limiteds you can add a clip-on tour pack to like your road glide and your street glide really easily and it looks great and it comes on and off real seamlessly the soft tail chassis have a couple tour pack options in their hold fast product line none of which i don't think anyone would ever put on the lowrider st so i think the solution that a lot of lowrider st buyers are going to do is the old sissy bar with a tea bag on the back which isn't all bad but then you lose functionality you can't lock it you're always having to strap it onto your bike and then sometimes it rubs in weird ways it's just never as clean and as functional as a tour pack is When I first saw the bike, I was really hoping it would be between that 22 and 22.5 price range. And then when it came out at 21,749, I was really impressed with the value proposition on this bike. But overall guys, Harley Davidson has an absolute grand slam winner here. As many of you know, I've been advocating for a bike just like this for a long time now. I know Harley Davidson's been working on this bike for several years just to make sure the style and the aerodynamics of this fairing is just spot on. I personally love the style. I think it's a perfect blend of old school and new technology that is still pays homage to the original FXRT fairing, but also modernizes the technology and the lines in it. One of the things that myself and a lot of people say when they first see this bike is, wow, the fairing is actually a lot smaller than I thought it would be. And the more I think about it, the more that it just makes sense. The fairing is very proportionate to a smaller soft tail chassis. That, and if guys wanted a big old fairing, they'd probably go to the Batwing or the Road Glide fairing. So you're getting a lot of the wind deflection benefits in a smaller, tighter, leaner package. The only negative thing about this bike at this point is they're going to be extremely hard hard to get. With production being so low right now and this bike being so hot, most dealership's inventory is already soaked up by deposits and pre-orders. But honestly, I see this bike being in Harley-Davidson's lineup for a long time to come. And although it's still really early to tell, I think this is going to be one of the most popular and most successful models that Harley-Davidson has ever launched in the history of the motor company. Who I'd recommend this bike to? If you're a guy that likes the lower weight class, a mid-weight touring capable bike, I should say, as opposed to like the full touring chassis that Harley-Davidson is so well known for. You want to have a bike that still has a, a more favorable power to weight ratio, a bike that has the capability of going out on a long road trip, cross country, 65 mile an hour plus for long duration down, you know, down the highway. This is a great bike. If you're someone though that does mostly that, if you do, I'd say more than 50% of your riding is all highway miles, like myself personally, and you're on the taller side and you want additional space for your stuff, I would say go with the touring bike. This bike though, I would say is very, very capable for, for people that don't want to go all in on the big 850 pound road glide or street glide or something like that. Guys that want a really a good crossover bike that can be both your awesome ripper around town, canyons, and you also want the touring capability, this is kind of a really good all around bike that is a, somewhat of a Swiss Army knife bike that can just be used for a lot of different applications. And the style is right on. Harley Davidson, I think really hit the, the nail on the head with this bike. They did a lot of things right. This is gonna be probably one of the most popular well, I won't say probably, this has been the most popular bike in terms of people calling and requesting it at our dealership, probably in the history of the 65 years we've been in business. So 
really excited about it. Harley Davidson did their homework. They've been listening to the rider community, you guys, and they they pushed all the buttons. They did everything right on this thing. I really think Harley Davidson has reinvented the middleweight fairing equipped cruisers. Yes, this classification of motorcycle has been dabbled in before by Harley Davidson and other motorcycle manufacturers, but in my opinion, never has it been executed on this high of a level before. With this high of a performing bike with a style that has a mass appeal, I just think Harley Davidson's nailed it on this one. Definitely look to see Polaris knocking this one off very soon. Thanks a lot for watching guys. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. I really appreciate all the viewership and the subscribers over the years. Thanks for your constant input and interaction. As always, if you're looking for a bike in Southern California, make sure you hit us up at Laidlaw's Harley Davidson where we have absolutely no added dealer markup and no prep fees. We'll see you on the next one guys. Later.